All right, Luke 22. Have you found that by now? Or did you forget that's where I asked you to go? Luke 22. I probably, I promise not to keep you too long tonight. I'm not quite sure what too long is. Luke 22, verses 39 through 46. Speaking of Christ, And he came out and went, as he was wont, what was normal for him, to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. It's important that we follow Christ at all times. Verse 40, And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And there was a particular issue about to happen. And we'll talk about that tonight. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Anybody ever feel like that? Yes. Looking at something that the Lord has brought you towards or to, or maybe not really understanding why you have arrived at something, and you say, Lord, take me out of this. But nevertheless, not my will. I need you to get that tonight. Not my will. But thine be done. Amen. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer, he was come to his disciples. He found them sleeping for sorrow and said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray lest you enter into temptation. The temptation not to fulfill the will of God will be a place or a situation that all of us as believers will find ourselves in. Sometimes are more heightened than others. Some other times are more important than others. But it's always important that we follow the will of God. We as the children of God have been purchased. The Bible says that we have been bought with a price and we are not our own. Right. I'm afraid that American Christianity doesn't really teach that, that it doesn't really preach that. Uh, if you turn on some of the major television preachers today, uh, they'll teach you that being a Christian is the entryway to everything that could be fabulous. It's time for you to realize your destiny, that God doesn't want you just at the bottom, but he wants everyone at the top. My friend, that's not Christianity. That's selling Christianity. The true Christianity is going to demand a price of us that we don't always see coming. <laughs> That's good. It will demand more of you than you think you can give. Yeah. But it will take you to places you could never get if you don't follow right. him right. Right. through the roads that he designs for you. And so tonight, I want to simply preach a message entitled Gethsemane, the place of surrender. Gethsemane, the place of surrender. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We love you. We give you glory and we give you honor. We pray that as we look through the text tonight, as we see the example of your son as a man on this earth, that we would grasp the place, each one of us, that you desire for us to be, that we would not turn away from that which is before us, even if it seems as though it might bring defeat, hurt, or harm to our person. Father, I thank you for what you are about to do, and I thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit that we've already experienced. Now, Lord, anoint me to minister this word. Let the preacher come, let the teacher come, and let the same minister to the hearts and minds 
of those who have ears to hear. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, amen. and amen. amen. Gethsemane was the garden place that Jesus oftentimes resorted to. This would be the last time in his earthly sojourn, at least that we have a record, that he would travel to the garden and that he would kneel before his father and try to find the strength and the power to travel through the event of Calvary. Now, we look at Calvary from after the fact. And after the fact is always easier than before the fact. If you look back at the trials or perhaps some of the journeys of your life, what you've been through, you can talk about easier than you went through. Right, right. Okay, am I, am I, nobody's ever been through anything. You look back and you go, I'm glad that's done. But when we follow God specifically, when we yield ourselves to Him holistically, these moments in time are going to come. They are going to be confronting us in our lives. And we've got to determine beforehand uh, what we're going to do when those times come. When God leads us to a place that we don't quite understand and we don't really see all the answers. Now, that's true about us. It wasn't true about Jesus. Jesus knew right. what was about to happen. There was no mystery uh, in his heart and in his mind. This plan of redemption carried out at Calvary was in the mind of God before the world was formed. Before the world was made, there was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Amen. Jesus knew and had volunteered to travel to this earth to pay the price for our sin, your sin and mine. And that's what Christianity is supposed to be preaching. This is God's redemption of mankind from all sin. When Jesus went to the cross as the Lamb of God, the Bible says in Isaiah 53 that the Lord laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Every wrong thought, every wrong action, every wrong deed of anyone that has ever lived for all time, if they've ever breathed, whatever there was that was negative, that was ungodly, that was wrong, it was placed on the shoulders of Christ. Jesus, the Son of God, perfect and sinless. He didn't become sin. He became the sin bearer. And on Calvary, He paid the price for every sin that you and I or any other person might ever commit. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid the price for all men's sins. And since all sin was laid on him, three days later, when he got up from the grave and conquered death, it was evidence that God said all sin has paid for. Because if there was one sin that had been placed on him as the sin bearer that wasn't covered, that wasn't forgiven, that wasn't dealt with, then God could not have legally raised him from the dead by the Spirit. It would have been an illegal move, and God's character would not allow that. I say that to you to say that there is not one. One failure. There is not one issue. There is not one block. There is not one wrong thing you have ever done, thought, or reviewed that Jesus hasn't already paid for. And all we have to do is keep our faith in Him when we fail, not if we fail, but when we fail, we say, Father, forgive me. I believe that 2,000 years ago, Jesus paid the price for my sin. And we get up from our failure and we arise out of the mud and the despair and the harm that that failure has brought us and we look full into the redemption of Calvary and we rise again in his grace and his power and his strength. Oh, Brother Larson, you're just preaching a sin in religion. No, I'm preaching what God did for humanity and the only way for us to be healed. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus
Jesus knew what was ahead. But he comes to the Garden of Gethsemane, and it doesn't show it in this text, but in other of the synoptics and in the other Gospels, he actually prayed the same prayer three times. Now, incidentally, if someone's tried to teach you that you can't ask God the same thing more than once, let's just watch what Jesus did. He asked him three times. He said, Father, if there's any other way, if there is any other way, He's not going to. He's not going to abrogate the will of God. He's not going to go anywhere that God doesn't want him to go. But he asks, like you and I do sometimes. Oh, I wish I'd get an amen in here. The Lord is there. Is there? I see what's up ahead. Is there any other? Come on, help me here. Is there any other way? And each time he goes, but not my will. Nevertheless. Not my will. God will listen to every request that we have. Yes. He'll listen to every heartbeat that goes his way from a heart and mind that's honest. And don't be afraid to talk to God. Amen. Amen. Talk to God about yes. what you're going yes. through. Yes. Talk to God about what you see, about what you think. And if you're concerned about what the future has and holds for you, then say, Lord, I, if there's any other way but that path, can we take it? But nevertheless, not my... See, and, it, and Gethsemane was the place where this took place. The greatest battle in the spirit world that ever took place against a human being took place here. The battle was so strong in our text, we read that Jesus had to push through right. and pray and sweat as great drops of blood. That's intense. And there is a medical condition in which they can describe it, but not too many people get there. We'll never probably fight that strong against something that's trying to move us from the will of God. We wouldn't make it, but Jesus made it. Amen. Jesus went through. Gethsemane itself is interesting because the word Gethsemane actually means oil press. And it's a place where olives were uh, brought from the vine and crushed. Then they were placed under heat and crushed again. Gethsemane, the place of crushing, the place of bruising. And God has to take us there to remove some of the things yeah. that we don't need. Yes. See, a, a lot of this preaching that's going on out there in the world is going to tell you how, how you're supposed to accumulate everything. Mm -hmm. right. And how your <laughs> destiny is to be in control. And mm -hmm. God, has, But God is interested in adding to you. I say yes and amen. Our God is a blessing God. But... He's also going to remove. Right. He's in the removal business. Yeah. Yeah. And there's some things in you and I that oh, need now. to be yeah. removed. And the yes, only sir. place for them to be removed is at the place of olive press. Yes. The place of breaking. The place of crushing. And it's at that point in time where we finally let go of things that God has been trying to let us let go of. Does anybody understand what I'm yes. trying to say? Yes. So I just want to come to you tonight, and I don't want to discourage you. I don't want to uh, hurt you tonight. I want to prepare you for that moment in time. And I have to believe that some of you are here because God gave me this text a week ago, and I've known I was going to preach it a week ago, and he knew exactly who would be here and who would be in this audience, and I believe there's some of you traveling through this Gethsemane experience right now, this crushing, if you will. And I want to talk to you tonight about four places or really uh, arenas relative to surrender. I want to talk about the place of surrender. I want to talk about the price of surrender. I want to talk about the peace of surrender. And I'm going to talk about pressing through 
after surrendering because this is things that we see in this text now that's a lot of stuff and i'm going to keep my eye on the clock and if you fall asleep i'll stop but one amen would have been nice there <laughs> doesn't matter verse 39 and he came out and went as he was wont to the mount of olives and his disciples followed him Jesus was led to the place of surrender where he would have to acknowledge the will of God and finish the task that God had given him. Now, I want to finish the task, whatever it is that God has given me. Jesus would oftentimes pray in the evening or early in the morning to make sure that he was in line with his father's will and so he only wants to do what his father says do he only wants to say what his father says uh, he's supposed to say and his disciples followed him to Gethsemane ladies and gentlemen we still need to follow him to Gethsemane we still need to go and seek God for the will of God so oftentimes that's not even in the American Christian's mind we're just thinking how can God bless me I'm really living for God just slightly above love of self and that is love of God for self that means that I'm serving God for what he can do for me that's American Christianity we've got to come out of that mentality and start to find the mind of God for ourselves it's not going to make a thousand people jump into your church when you start preaching this but I'm telling you what it'll create a powerful church of individuals who have a desire and a design to follow and know and perform the will of God you want God to do something in America today? Well, it starts with us. Are we willing to travel and follow the Lord to Gethsemane where we find the will of God? Now, the Christian is a lot of times asking over and over and over, how do I find the will of God? Well, first of all, prayer has to be a vital portion of your life in Christ. You have to have a prayer life. Amen. Let me preach over here. You have to have a prayer life. Let me get you in the middle. You need a prayer life. You need to be talking to your father. Jesus example this. And I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about setting aside a time every day, whether you do it in the morning, that's my time, or the afternoon or the night. But you talk to God about where you are, what you think he wants, and you ask him to show you. You have a conversation. You don't just tell him things. You listen Amen. as well. You're going to have to develop a, a, a prayer time. And when things that you have to make major decisions about, I'm talking about knowing the will of God. Right. When you need to know the will of God beyond a shadow of a doubt, you might need to spend some extra time of prayer. Amen. 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 That's good. Because knowing the will of God for your life is by far the most important aspect of your Christian experience. I know that as my life has been uh, confronted with different changes at different times, I've, I've gone, I, I pray in the morning, I have that time frame, but then I would set aside, especially trying to find the mind of God. When I was searching, I'd set a time, an extra half an hour at lunch where I would find a time of prayer. And I'd just say, Lord, I'm not quite sure what, what to do. I'm not quite sure how to go. And, and sometimes it would take months and months and months and months to get an answer. Months and months and months, <laughs> but not seconds. See, he said, if you'll knock and keep on knocking, if you'll seek and keep on seeking, if you'll ask and keep on asking, don't ask once and give up. You've got to know the will of God for your life. You've got to know the mind of God for your life. And your prayer life is going to help establish that. Also, uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says that we're not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. <coughs> Uh, we are to be having our minds renewed. This is where the message of the cross really comes in. Because if you know what to place your faith in on a consistent basis, the Holy Spirit, who's the master teacher, is going to be living in you, speaking in you, 
dealing with you right. and showing you where you're just desiring things for self and where you're desiring the things of God, what is of God and what is not. A lot of people today, they don't know because the work of the Holy Spirit in them isn't happening. There's a difference, lady, and I'm Pentecostal from the top of my head to the sole of my feet, but the baptism with the Holy Spirit isn't for sanctification. Right, right. Amen. The baptism with the Holy Spirit is for evangelism. It's for service. It's to make Christ powerful and real in the hearts of other people. Uh, and, and, and it does splash back over kind of in a secondary manner for sanctification. But your growth as a believer is dependent upon who you depend on. And what you depend on in your daily life as a believer. If you look to Jesus and believe that what he did for you at Calvary is sufficient to release the power, the grace of God into your life, that grace will come and that grace will begin to flow. And the master teacher that lives on the inside of every believer, whether you speak in tongues or not, you receive the Holy Spirit at the moment you get saved. Get it right. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, and again, listen, I'm Pentecostal from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. The Pentecostal is a second subsequent work for service and evangelism. But the first work is available to every single born again believer. The grace of God changes us the minute we accept him. I was a drunk when Jesus saved me. I was a drug addict and a drug dealer when Jesus saved me. And immediately he began to take out some of those things and some of those ways of living. I wasn't baptized with the Holy Spirit until six months after I was born again. And the power of the born again experience and the grace of God and your faith in Jesus is what will allow you to start experiencing Christianity, not externally, internally. Amen. So that you're changed on the inside and then what we do is just second nature because now it's just right that I talk that way. It's just right that I live this way. It just feels right because the nature of God is being birthed in me. And my mind is being renewed not to trust in me but to trust in Him and depend upon Him and to have a relationship with Him. So if I want to have uh, the mind of God and I want to know the will of God, I've got to have the grace of God changing me from from glory to glory to glory to glory, taking things out, putting things in. Now I'm in tune with the master teacher. He's inside of me to lead me into all truth, not some. And some of that truth that I need to know is the will of God. And when my mind is being renewed, Romans 12 and 2, that we can prove or put to the test what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God? So number one, if I am seeking the will of God, which I should be, especially when I'm coming to a crossroads in my life, I'm going to spend time in prayer. Number two, I'm going to let the cross and the message of the cross release the grace of God into my heart because my faith is not in a mantra. It's not in a bumper sticker or a bobblehead. It's in Jesus. Jesus. I'm afraid sometimes the people that hear the message of the cross is, what? The message of the cross. What? The message of the... And it's just a mantra. It's just a saying. Now, I'm not trying to make it a saying. It just, seems, it just is, you got to be trusting Jesus and what he did for you. And he will transform your life. And then you can put to the test what is the perfect will of God for your life. And thirdly, not only does prayer matter determining the will of God, living the cross life, but I'll give you this passage, and I, I really appreciate them putting these up on the screen. Write this one down, because you're going to come back to it again. James chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Want to know the will of God? What did James say? He said that the wisdom that is from above is, here we go, number one, pure, that means there's no evil or sin in the decision that you're making. Amen. Amen. Number two, it's peaceable. 
It brings peace to your heart and peace to your mind. Well, you need to be careful about that because flesh can feel peace too. Right. Come on now. Number three, it's gentle. Number four, it's easy to be entreated. This is easy for you. Just step up and do it. Just head that way. Whatever that will of God is. Number five, it's full of mercy. Number six, it's full of good fruit. Number seven, it's without partiality. There's no, there's no prejudice to this decision. Mm. And it's without hypocrisy. You don't have to pretend. So if you need to make a decision about the will of God, put it to the wisdom test. Does it fit all this criteria? If, it, if there's part of it that doesn't fit the criteria, well, then I would say, Lord, maybe this that I'm thinking is your will isn't. Prayer, living the cross life, giving it the wisdom test. You'll find the will of God. God wants us to find the will of God. Now, when I say the will of God, uh, and you come to know it, it, it is the revealed will of God. It's always in line with his word. Do I even have to say that? It's always in line with his word. Amen. So when you come to me and said, God told me to shoot my wife and marry her, I'm going to say, no, nope, that's not the will of God. And your current wife is going to look at me and say, thank you, brother. As a pastor, you would be surprised as to what I've heard was supposedly the will of God. If it's contrary to the word, if it's not pure, then it's not the will of God. So I can, but most of the time, the things that we have to find that is the will of God are gray areas. They're not quite, we're just not quite, we're digging, we're trying to find, and I'm just trying to lay some groundwork for you as a pastor, as a teacher. How do you find the will of God? You establish a prayer life. You live the cross life. You put the decisions that you're trying to make under the wisdom test. And so, once we start determining the will of God along, I'm talking about now the place of surrender, now comes along temptation. Now what does temptation do? Always it does this. It is an opportunity to get us to leave or refuse the revealed will of God. Listen, if you, if you see God, you're going to find Him. If you ask Him, He's going to show you. And beyond a shadow of a doubt, you'll be able to put to the test and prove what is the will of God. And now once you know the will of God, you're going to end up being tempted at times to either not go there or to leave where he placed you. Okay, this isn't getting you to swing off the chandelier and not at all, is it? It's not meant to. Temptation comes and gets us moving away and out of what God has designed for us. And there's a temptation is could be general in the sense that it's could be anyone's temptation. Temptation to lust, temptation to steal, temptation to lie. But I'm really speaking tonight more of an individual sense where God has given you specific instruction. And now Satan and flesh want to go somewhere other than the place of surrender. We've got to re recognize that not only will powers of darkness oppose the will of God, but our flesh will oppose the good. Now, flesh is too complicated for me to get into tonight, as, but I can tell you this, that as long as you're breathing and as long as the rapture and the change that is promised us has not taken place, you're walking in flesh. <laughs> Okay, I am looking at a bunch of flesh in this place. <laughs> and you be looking at some flesh. Because we live in flesh. And flesh is not completed into the glory of God. And there are things in us that will oppose or push away from the will of God. And Temptation can come from externally, but it can also come internally. Right. 
Right. Oh man, I can't go through that. I can't pay that price. I can't accomplish that. And and flesh is really the 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 lust of the flesh. It's I don't want it. I want what I want. Yeah. Me. Lord, me. I want me. Yeah. You're not thinking about me, Lord. You're not really considering me. What I want me. 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 I, me. The big important one in all the world is just me. 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 me, 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 me. And not you. And not you. And not you. Not you. Not you. Not you. Me. 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 Me, oh, just me, and not you at all, just me. Yeah. That's flesh. Oh, that's not good for me. I can't do that because me don't like that. Me won't get blessed there. Me don't see why me would get anything out of me being there. So I can't me go there. Flesh doesn't always see the benefit as it looks at the will of God and it pushes against where God wants to take you. And I'm, it's such an important aspect. You need to realize that we're not quite as far along as we might think. And all of us have the capacity to yield to that fleshly tendency on the inside of us. The lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes, and that is a desire to own or a desire to possess. Is what you desire to own and what you desire to possess moving you out of the will of God? Come on. How about the pride of life, who we are and what we have? Come on. Yeah. Oh, man, don't you know who I am? <laughs> don't you know what I have? Lord, you're asking me to give that up? You're asking me to move out of that? Why? I've spent all this time establishing that. I am, don't you know what I have? Don't you? What do you mean you're going to take that away? See, the pride of life is who we are and what we have. And sometimes God has to strip us of things to equip us with what has the future. But we don't see the future. We'll never know the will of God because we can't get beyond what we think we're about to lose because who can stand us? See, we're, do, we, are, we are creatures that desire to own. We desire to have. I know you, okay, you just upgraded your home. You just upgraded your car. And you thought, man, if I could just get that new car. So you go down to the dealer, you overpay for the car, you got a bigger note that you wanted, you get home a week later, you're thinking about what you're going to own next. <laughs> because the pride of life is we're going to own it. 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 And those designs can take us right out of the will of God. So we have to understand that all of this has to be laid aside. Don't love the world, neither the things that are in the world. And Jesus said that uh, if you, if the, the world is going to pass away and everything that you want in it is going to disappear. But listen, he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. Yeah. So why would we exchange a temporary feature of a life that is not eternal for what is everlasting? Right. Don't be drawn away from the will of God. Once you've prayed, once you're living the Christian life and He's guiding you on a path and He takes you to the place of surrender, say, ah, okay. The place of surrender. And then it, it's, it's then you'll learn the price of surrender. You know what the price of surrender is? There's only one. It's the... I will. That's really the only thing you have to offer Him. I, I will. That's the price. You know one of the terms that the Apostle Paul uses to describe himself that he loves the most is... A bond slave. Paul, a servant. In the Greek, it's bond slave. It's a it's a, a specific term, and it describes a Hebrew man 
in the Hebrew culture, who is, has his inheritance, has his land, has his farm, has his agricultural status, and he's just not a good manager of it for whatever reason, or maybe things out of his control like drought or flood or fire comes in and he loses it all, and there, he, doesn't have, he doesn't have any money, he doesn't have any income. And one of the options that he had as a Hebrew was to indenture himself, become a servant or a slave to another Hebrew man. Now the law of Moses said that that could only last for six years, and at the end of six years in the seventh year, that the Hebrew man was to be able to be released. He could go back to his land, he could go back to his home, and, and, and what have you, and, and, and they indentured agreed upon price was paid and, and he's out of trouble, he's out of debt and he goes back to his farm. But at the end of his indentured time, if the servant, that guy, looks at it and says, you know what? I love my master. Amen. This is really good. I've got a good here. I never was a good manager of my own. I never really took care of the things that I thought I was gonna. I'm not doing too well over here. Can I just stay amen and you become the choice was that man could become a permanent slave or servant to the master that he now loved and cared for and if that was the case then they would take him up to a door they would take his ear and they would run an awl through it make a mark there and it indicated that he was a bond slave forever and it meant that his will was swallowed up in the will of his new master amen and paul said i'm a bond slave of jesus christ i tried handling things myself i tried going out and doing my but i didn't handle it too well and now i've been living with him for the last six years and you know what i know i can't do better for myself than he does for me so i think i'll just give myself over Come on. Because I love my master. Now, I'll give you the second reason. Sometimes that indentured servant during the six years would marry, maybe even have children. But at the end of the time frame, when his indenturement was over, when that time frame was done, if he got done and he wanted to leave, the wife still stayed with the master. And if there were kids, they belonged to the master. So he could leave, but he would have to he would have to leave his wife and children there. So sometimes being a bond slave isn't done just for the love of a master, but it's done for the love of other people. That's good. Amen. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah. I'm a bond slave, Paul said, of Jesus Christ. My will is swallowed up in the will of the master. And I do it because I love him I love somebody else. I want somebody else to get to know my Jesus. I want someone else to experience what I'm experiencing. So I willingly, this is the price of surrender. He's going to bring you to the place of the, where you determine his will, where you determine what he wants. And man, you can find it, but even after you know what it is, that flesh and those external things are going to hit you. But you've got to come to the price of surrender and just say, I want to be a bond slave because I love him and I love people more than I love what I think I want for myself. Amen. That's the price of surrender. Jesus comes to the garden. He said, Father, is there any other way? No. Then okay. I love you. And I love them. And I'll go to Calvary. There's a price of surrender. My friend, let me tell you something. When you find that place where you come to God and you say, Okay, there will be a supernatural peace that accompanies yeah. your surrender. Mm -hmm. And that peace is really the active, powerful grace of God. In our text, the Bible says when Jesus came to that place of surrender and he pays the price of surrender in verse 43 there appeared an angel unto him from heaven strengthening him. An angel came and gave him help and strengthen ministered to it 
You say, oh, I wish I could have an angel. Are you kidding? Do you know what you have on the inside of you? Do you know who you have living on the inside of you? When you succumb to the place of surrender and you yield your will and you pay the price of that surrender, then the peace of surrender is accomplished by the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. It will be peace that passes all understanding. It will not make sense a lot of times in the normal thinking of mankind. It won't look always like that's the best way for you to go. It may not look like that's the best choice, but you've been in prayer. You've been in the Word. You're living a surrendered life. You fought through the effort of the enemy. You were fighting through the effort of the flesh. And you said, Lord, I'm a bond slave like Paul to my master. And I'm not going to let anything turn my mind from the will of God. And I want the will of God. And all of a sudden, that peace that passes understanding, no one can describe it to you. But my friend, when it comes, it's an anchor to the soul. It'll place you somewhere and down next as we come to the last one you're going to need that anchor you're going to need to know that you know that you know that you know that God brought you somewhere and God gave you something and God placed you somewhere because all of hell is going to try to shake you from the will of God and move you out of the plan of God and get you to succumb to the instrument of the flesh and the instrument of other men and all all the other things that this world applies and tries to get you to. But when you pay the price of surrender and you come to that place of surrender, the Holy Ghost in you will say, you got this. You got this. When you're not sure that you'll even be able to face another day com doing, completing, or, or operating in the will of God, then the Holy Spirit on the inside of you will begin to fight for you. He'll begin to rise up in you. And when you didn't even think you could get your foot out of bed, God the Holy Ghost will start this. I say it this way. What's that? It, yeah, yeah. Lord, my Lord. Y'all a bunch of here. It's a tune-up. It's God the Holy Ghost. Sorry, Naya. It's a tune-up. It'll help you because it'll get down into your soul and all of a sudden there's this strength you never had. It doesn't come from the mind. It doesn't come from your own heart. It's not your will. It's the power of the Holy Ghost saying, that's it, girl. That's it, boy. That's it, boy. Go get it. Go get it. Go get it. So you'll find the peace of surrender, and it is a peace. You'll know it when it comes. You'll know it, and it'll confirm your path. Am I getting through to you today? I don't know where God has you. I don't know what God wants from you. I don't know what, it's going, what, what, he's, what he's trying to get you to or where he's taking you to, but I can tell you this, that once you find the will of God, you're going to have to press through the enemy to get it done. That's my last. Doesn't mean I'm done, but it's my last. It's the push or the pressing through of surrender. Jesus surrenders, and then Satan brings the big guns. Man, you got the mind of God. You chose as You chose it. You chose it. Oh, bless you. You chose it. Good for you. Yes, that's what we need. People who choose the will right. of God over that's the flesh, right. over temptation. Ah, people who pray, live this Christian oh, life. Find the mind oh, of God. Yeah. Find the will of God. That'll say yes. And experience that strength that comes. Yes, but then, as you set out to accomplish it, Probably the first couple of weeks, maybe even the first couple of months, it's you're walking in that peace of knowing, hey, I'm doing what God said to do. I'm right where God placed me. I'm doing right where. And then Satan comes with the push. Here it comes. Verse 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down. He's already said yes. He's already agreed. He already knows. And you'd think that God 
would just make it easy. Mm -hmm. But here comes the enemy because he knows that if you fulfill the will of God and accomplish what God wants, it'll be best for other people and it will be eternally best for you. Wow. Some of you are in that battle tonight. Some of you are fighting that perhaps tonight. The very will of God is at stake. And again, flesh pulls at us and doesn't want that which is uncomfortable. Look, dying isn't fun. <laughs> and you have to do it all day by yourself. <laughs> no one can do it for you. That's good. Jesus <coughs> says yes, and then the enemy comes. He's determined to do the will of God. He's accepted the will of God. He's received strength to do the will of God. I'm here to tell you, that if you'll keep your eyes on what he's told you to do, and you'll keep your eyes on Christ and what he's accomplished for you at Calvary. The enemy, though, he'll bring turmoil, though he'll bring attack after attack after attack after attack. He will not stop from accomplishing the will of God. And, again, that work of the Holy Spirit that lives in us, will bring you through those attacks. Amen. You're not going to live sweating great drops of blood forever. Amen. You're not going to be there forever. Hey, there might even be a hill you'll have to take with a cross on your back. You might even have to let them nail you to that cross. But if God allows that to happen, there's a third day coming. Yes. Yes. There's a third day coming. There's a third day coming. And what the devil doesn't know is that if you'll succumb to the will of God, even to the point of obedience to the death of the cross, then there's another blessing of the Lord come. If you read Philippians, you'll find that God gave him a name that is above every name. That's why when we were singing about him tonight, and the presence of God swept through this place. You sensed it. A dead man doesn't garner that kind of worship. But he's not just dead. He's alive. Yes. Yes. And God is exalted to the place where every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. Because he found himself in the place of surrender. He paid the price of surrender. He experienced the peace of surrender. And he pushed through the opposition to surrender. And allowed God to do what he wanted to do in him, with him, and to him. And God is not unjust when he views your sacrifice for the kingdom of God. Amen. He will not forget you. Right. And he will bring you to that place that you become what he needs in this time frame. Now I don't tell you, I'll tell you that it's going to be easy. But I tell you that there is nothing like accomplishing the will of, of God. But you're going to have to come through Gethsemane. Amen. You're going to have to come to that place of surrender. Amen. And let God do with your life what He wants done. Amen? Amen. 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 Would you stand with me tonight, Naya? Would you come? Amen. Brother Larson, I wish that you would preach something that made me happy. <laughs> the place of surrender is a difficult place. It is the crushing, the oil press, the time frame where it seems as if the hand of God and the feet of God are stomping the life out of us. That's not his intention for the long term, but it is his immediate purpose. And I'm, I'm not going to be long here at all. I'm simply going to tell you that if you're finding yourself tonight entering in the garden, 
waiting on him for the leading or guiding or you've got to make that decision to surrender you've got to make that decision he's here tonight to give you the peace and the strength and the grace that you need to accomplish the will that only he can tell you to accomplish the task that only he has set for you but if you're here tonight and you need to pray about it for a few minutes before we leave this place why don't you just step out from where you are meet at this altar and let's say 